uh, for this opportunity that you have given me. Uh, just to all the uh, the participants here, when uh, Dr. Chanama was telling me about uh, the this particular workshop, and basically, if you mean with, uh, going through my profile, you might have uh, understood that you know my area of uh, expertise is not into biometrics, basically. So that's an uh, area. Uh, you know, I'm basically working in the area of text analytics, and then we have the web mining and so on. When she approached me regarding, uh, you know, uh, sir, can you talk, uh, give a talk on, uh, uh, you know, something that is very fascinating today. For example, everybody is talking about social media. Everybody is talking about uh, how, uh, you know, uh, the different uh, persons or different uh, entities behave in social media. Can we consider that as one of the trait? And can you uh, take an example and then, you know, uh, use it in the biometrics. You know, it 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 was actually a kind of uh, interesting at that part of time. I said, okay, you know, uh, let me just check because I was also working uh, in what is known as the cyber security and cyber threats, and uh, that's how we are actually connected. That Dr. Chanama and myself, you know, we are we have a common thing regarding cyber security. So basically, uh, when I, when she approached me, uh, you know. Uh, we did have some kind of publication on cyber uh, threats and cyber uh, uh, security uh, considering the text aspect of it so you know i just wanted to know how uh, we can have this biometrics and this cyber security put in a picture and believe me it uh, it has taken me uh, some time definitely i had to become a research scholar again i had to go through all these surveys uh, you know, honestly, I had to spend a lot of time uh, looking at the different survey papers, understand, and also the recent trends, you know, because that's what I was talking about, because my area is basically uh, text and social media and so on. How these two can be, you know, uh, uh, can be clubbed together, how uh, we can find some kind of an association. Uh, you know, uh, interestingly, there were some uh, literatures and I found it very useful so that, you know, uh, you know, these things can be shared, all these things can be shared with you. Okay, so without actually... Thank you very uh, much, sir. Actually, you have uh, taken such a, you know, <laughs> uh, new topic and, uh, uh, and uh, what uh, you have uh, uh, given interest and uh, uh, respected my words. <laughs> actually, uh, it was completely new area, but even I thought that how people behave in uh, in internet in cyberspace that could be a, a biometric threat so that is my idea anyway thank you for taking this uh, uh, you know work uh, thank you very much okay marla let me share my presentation Uh, you're able to see my presentation? Yes, sir. Okay, madam. Thank you. So as informed, you know, like, again, uh, this is something like, you know, I'm trying to come out with some things, you know, biometrics, most of you are very familiar with uh, uh, the participants. I think uh, most of them are uh, the research scholars working in this area of uh, biometrics. And uh, uh, when we when we talk about something called the cyberspace, uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of elements that gets added to it so probably one of the very interesting uh, you know the trait is what we call as the behavioral biometrics so i'll be talking about what exactly is uh, uh, these things you know so uh, let's get started um, so what i'll be doing is basically i'll be just giving you an introduction again this introduction would be very brief because you know you've been hearing about biometrics and uh, from the best of people because you know they are working on it so therefore i have to give you only a brief introduction about what exactly is uh, the biometrics and so on and then i'll be giving up uh, uh, giving you some examples of uh, how behavioral biometrics uh, is applicable in the cyberspace because when we talk about a cyber space this is the space that uh, everybody is in without uh, any doubt for example the moment we get up in the morning and we just you know we'll just uh, probably look at the mobile phone and look for messages, profiles, and so many things. So uh, directly or indirectly, we are connected. We are that node that is part of the, the cyberspace. So, you know, that, that's how things are. Uh, 
And then, very interestingly, I found one, uh, you know, uh, important research paper. I think, you know, this is also one of the area that I'll be working uh, henceforth, uh, published by uh, uh, one of the universities in Canada. It's called as social behavioral biometrics. Uh, this is this, you know, this made me very fascinating and had to put some time there to understand things. And then I will be coming out with some a couple of case studies, and these case studies definitely will help you understand uh, what exactly is this social behavioral biometrics and so on. And then, uh, obviously, to conclude, I'll just uh, start, you know have some applications and the conclusion. And uh, again, I just want to acknowledge all the uh, the authors, uh, you know, uh, the listed authors as well as the other authors. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, their work was responsible because again, I'm telling you, I have to spend a lot of time uh, because my background is not biometrics. So I have to understand things. So therefore, you know, I, had, uh, I just happened to, uh, you know, research uh, these literatures. I have to go through them. I had and I completely take, uh, you know, I completely acknowledge uh, the materials published by these authors for this presentation. Yeah, let's talk about the introduction. So when we talk about the introduction, you know, biometric technologies, uh, they are there uh, to provide something like uh, user friendly and uh, reliable control uh, kind of an access to computer systems and networks and workplaces. So that this is uh, this has been reported in many of the uh, literatures and the majority of the research was aimed at studying what is known as a well established physical biometric such as fingerprints or it could be iris scan and so on. Behavioral biometrics uh, was less explored, uh, you know, in the early uh, 2000, and now more or less, uh, you know, uh, uh, there have been more research in this particular uh, area too. We call it as a behavioral biometrics, and when we this behavioral biometrics, uh, uh, you know, uh, it 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 considers something like you know uh, the 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 movement of muscles. It could be something like you know the keystroke, or it could be the the gait or the signature. All these were uh, all these were uh, considered to be there, but uh, one of the advantages that we talk about uh, the behavioral biometrics is that you know compared to the traditional biometrics is that you know uh, the data probably can be collected you know uh, as per the literature data can be collected with or without the knowledge of the subject. So uh, the collection uh, and also it is believed that the collection does not require uh, any kind of a specialized hardware. And is found to be very cost effective. And uh, again, in the literature, uh, the bio, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, the literature says that most of the behavioral biometrics are not unique. So they're not unique, and uh, they also say that you know, however, they have shown uh, to be providing some uh, you know uh, some accuracies in the identity verification. And again, the author. Uh, you know, as a research author has classified the uh, the behavioral biometrics into the five uh, categories uh, based on uh, the type of information. So the first category is what we call as the authorship based biometrics. So when we talk about the authorship based biometrics, it is basically trying to determine who this particular who uh, the author is. So it is based on uh, examining what is known as the piece of it could be the text or it could be something like the drawing produced by a person and so on. So based on these kind of uh, the contents, so you're trying to establish what is known as the authorship. Uh, authorship. So that's what is called as the, the authorship based biometrics. And the second category is what we call as the human computer interaction. So uh, most of the researchers, they know for sure that, you know, this is one of the interesting area of research, which called as the HCI. So here, the second category is talking about something called the human computer interaction based biometrics, uh, because the, the understanding here is, you know, the human beings employ uh, different strategies. They have their own styles. They have their own abilities. So these things can be uh, definitely used to successfully verify the identity of a particular subject. So that is the, uh, the category number two. And again, uh, here, the authors have, uh, research authors have actually uh, divided these uh, HCI based biometrics into two categories. Uh, the first category happens to be called as uh, uh, the human interaction with the improved devices such as the keyboard or it could be the mouse or it could be haptics or, uh, you know, which can register some distinct uh, 
uh, and consisting uh, consistent uh, you know consistent uh, muscle actions and the second category it talks about uh, the hci based that is human computer interaction based behavioral biometrics which measures the advanced behavior it could be something like the skill exhibited by the user or it could be the knowledge or it could be the strategy employed by the uh, the, the subject or by the person or during the interaction with the kind of softwares so this is how they have categorized now coming out to the original uh, you know i was talking about the five categories and coming out to the third category now when we talk about the third category this third category is closely related to what is known as the second category and is 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 the set of indirect hci based biometrics uh, which are basically events that are obtained by monitoring what is known as the user's hci behavior indirectly or uh, you know through uh, low level actions of the computer software so this could be like for example uh, you can analyze the system called traces you can analyze what is known as the audit logs you can uh, analyze what is known as the program execution traces and then we all know we have a registry a registry accesses storage activities calls that uh, call stack data analysis system calls and so on so these actions on these kind of uh, you know uh, the 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 softwares uh, the actions of the users on these kind of softwares will help us to understand uh, uh, the what is known as uh, the uh, the hi that is indirect hci based biometric traits then coming on to something called the the fourth category so the fourth category you know as per the researcher uh, who is published he says this is the best research category and that's called as the behavioral biometrics because it relies on something called the motor skills of the users to uh, identify the verification part when we talk about the motor skills what exactly we mean by a motor skill motor skill is basically an ability of the human beings to use muscles so when we talk about muscle movements so muscle movements basically rely on so many things like could be for example it could be the proper functioning of the brain or it could be the you know proper functioning of the joints the nervous systems and so on so which indirectly reflect the quality of functioning of these kind of systems and making uh, you know the identification or the verification uh, of these kind of people possible so then when we talk about something like uh, the category number 5 so category number 5 it basically talks about purely bi behavioral biometrics and it measures what is known as the human behavior uh, not directly by actions uh, such as the way he walks such as the way he holds the grip and so on but it utilizes uh, strategies skills and knowledge exhibited by the subject or the humans uh, for a mentally demanding task okay so that is how they have categorized this as purely behavioral biometrics and when we talk about purely biometrics so purely behavioral sir, biometrics madam sir are you in first slide no actually i am in the second slide okay okay now it has changed sir oh okay okay not in the second slide now you are in somewhere like seven no sorry i am in the eighth slide yeah yeah till now it was in the first slide only oh okay 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 so then i'll keep it this way then okay sir okay so the category 5 as i mentioned it is talking about something called uh, purely behavioral biometrics so when it talks about purely behavioral uh, biometrics now as i mentioned it measures the human behaviors not directly by actions uh, such as i mentioned the way he walks or he holds the grips and so on but it uses a different uh, strategies like for example it could be the skills the knowledge exhibited by the the user uh, during a uh, 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 during a particular task and you know uh, the uh, this particular uh, behavioral biometrics quantifies such traits and then you know makes uh, identification a possibility so this is what we call as the purely behavioral biometrics so basically the author has classified it wonderfully into five categories now let's take a few examples of behavioral biometrics so i call it as something like you know which is very relevant to the cyberspace when i say cyberspace it includes every the examples that will be followed or the examples that will follow 
uh, will be applicable not only to the uh, uh, the host system it will not be applicable to the servers or storage servers or the cloud it will be available, you know it will be applicable to any uh, space uh, that's why it's simply called as the cyberspace now uh, the first one is what we call as the audit logs see audit logs are very very uh, most of us understand what exactly is audit and also we understand the term called logs so we know what exactly is audit logs audit logs are basically you know a kind of inspection of records so simply you know put uh, to put in simple words it is a, a, a examination of records now why do we need to, because you know when we talk about the cyberspace uh, you know there are a lot of records a lot of transaction that gets recorded in uh, uh, it could be systems it could be the servers it could be the storage server or it could be a, uh, the cloud anywhere so there are things like that now uh, the purpose of uh, what is known as the audit logs is that it will help us to understand it will help us to be accountable so that's why we say user accountability and it helps us to uh, recreate events because you know uh, it helps us to understand how this particular event would have happened and third definitely it would help us to understand whether there was any kind of a compromise whether there was any kind of a compromise and any other issues can be identified by using what is called as an audit lock so this is a very simple objective what is called as an audit lock and again, uh, as per standards, uh, because most of us would be familiar with something called the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So any standard for that matter, they say that we need to conduct what is known as a periodic review of things. So this periodic review of things would become very, very useful when we talk about something called security of cyberspace or security of systems. So this is what is required. So periodically, we need to review so as to get an insight into uh, the actions and identify the, uh, the actors and so on. Madam, now the slides are visible? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. yes sir. Yes, sir. That's it. OK, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when we talk about the audit logs, like, for example, we know most of the operating systems do keep some kind of records of the user activity and program interaction. And uh, the, the, the objective of uh, the audit trials, you know, the, ob uh, you know, the objective of the audit trials is to, you know, is to uh, identify some interesting behavioral uh, patterns. And this would become very interesting for the, the people who are working on that. For example, the intrusion detection team you know, people are working on intrusion detection team. So they will be very much interested in to know what is known as the behavioral pattern of uh, such, uh, you know, intrusion. And uh, a typical, uh, a typical uh, when you talk about a typical audit log, a typical audit log may contain what? It contains a lot of information. It contains like, for example, information on the processor. It contains information on the input output. It contains the number of connections. Uh, from each location, which director, directory was accessed, which file was created, whether there was some kind of a user ID that got changed, audit record was modified, and so on. So these are things that gets recorded in the audit, rock, uh, audit log. So experimentally, it is shown by the researchers that collecting audit records or collecting these audit events is found to be less intrusive. So, you know, I'm emphasizing the word called less intrusive here because it's a less intrusive technique than recording system calls. So hence, we are not actually intruding uh, the, 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 uh, the, the privacy or whatever. So what we are doing is we are just collecting it from uh, the, the locks. So uh, the, the informations are considered very valuable and uh, that are available in the uh, audit locks and a large number of uh, uh, researchers are attracted to this form of what is called as the human computer interface based biometrics. So that means they are trying to analyze, they are trying to analyze the behavioral pattern of uh, the, the imposter, they are trying to analyze the, uh, the behavioral pattern of uh, an attacker, uh, trying to, you know, to uh, do things or trying to change uh, things in uh, trying to change things or uh, trying to uh, incur events and based on the type of events and activities of the events they are uh, they are trying to record uh, they are trying to assess the behavioral pattern of the attacker so this is also one of the area uh, that people are working and this could be one of the good example for hci based biometrics 
then you have something called the biometric sketch i think you know uh, most of us would be very familiar with the uh, the ancient uh, stories and ancient uh, you know uh, uh, the 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 uh, the the text mentioned in the ancient uh, you know scriptures where you know there is something like it is always mentioning about something called uh, the sketches and the sketches being uh, used as an authentication and so on likewise you know you have something called the biometric sketch uh, the researchers have proposed something called the biometric sketch uh, it's based on the recognition of sketches and uh, this recognition of sketches will be possible with a particular person right so persons persons knowledge will be uh, put into test here to identify the sketch now uh, the, the 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 way that it works is basically uh, the system uh, you know allows uh, our direct user to create a simple sketch so it could be example uh, three circles and each user is free uh, to do uh, you know in 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 his ho in his or her way because you know you have to draw you have to use a, a simple sketch using three circles and there will be many combinations many uh, shapes that would emerge and uh, you know the knowledge uh, uh, is basically used as uh, in this particular knowledge is basically used to authenticate a particular user so you know similar uh, approaches have been uh, tried by different researchers and they have also come out with uh, what is known as a system and that's called as the pass doodles and another is another system that was called as the uh, draw a secret kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, a system that uh, that was developed where uh, the sketches was used as a authentication uh, a method to uh, allow uh, to allow what is known as uh, the the login or to allow a user to get into a, a system or a kind of a network then you have a very important uh, 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 one of the important behavioral pattern that's called as blinking you know you know i was i was really surprised i mean surprised in the sense uh, i was something like you know uh, there were uh, uh, i was you know blinking how you know probably i was thinking how blinking could also be a part of the research work but again uh, you know these researchers like you know uh, western et al and uh, you know they have actually uh, worked on it and they say that you know they have developed a system for identifying a user uh, by analyzing what is known as uh, the the blink pattern so they have uh, you know the, they analyze the blink pattern so it could be something like you play a song a familiar song would be played and then you know the blink pattern would be captured and that is called as a blink print so you have a blueprint and now you have a blink print so this blink print can be used and then you know just imagine when you uh, log into when just when you visit a supermarket and then you need to flash your a card or a smart card so a song would be played and then you know you would try to blink so based on the blinking pattern uh, and uh, you know you, you will be allowed uh, to get into the market supermarket and then again uh, do a transaction so that sounds very wonderful but again the question is something like uh, what about verification and all those issues again just can we just consider the blink of an eye or would that be good enough all these things are there but again the researchers say that uh, additional supplementary features can also be extracted such as the time between the blinks how long the high, uh, high how long the high was held closed at each blink and those are other physical characteristics can also be used in order to strengthen uh, uh, the 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 you know what is known as the uh, the results or the performance of this uh, system then uh, you have something called the call stack okay now what exactly is a call stack i think we know we because when we talk about uh, execution of a programs uh, we know you know how the program uh, is executed how the instructions are executed and all that right so uh, one of the researchers now here have uh, developed a method uh, called as the uh, anomaly detection so they have detected the anomaly using call stack call stack information so the idea is uh, just like this uh, the program counter we know pc the program counter so program counter basically indicates the correct uh, current execution point of the program so that means each instruction of the program corresponds to a unique program counter and this information is very useful for researchers to identify intrusion detection so that is the that is the point that is emphasized by this particular researcher so the idea he says is to return the address from the call stack so that means from the stack register so you need to return the 
you need to extract the return address and generate a path okay generate a path we call it as an generate an execution path between the two programs that are being executed so this particular path will be analyzed to find whether the path is valid based on what was learned during the training phase or during what is known as the normal execution of the program so this is how uh, the 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 author the researcher uh, feng et al have developed this particular method by using the program counter in order to detect what is known as the anomaly so here the behavioral pattern is uh, the anomaly detection uh, through what is known as the set of uh, steps executed in the call in the uh, call stack register so this is also shown to be uh, you know pro providing uh, what is known as uh, uh, this this method is all shown to provide a uh, better method it's shown to be uh, provide a better results in detecting the what is known as uh, the attacks and uh, it's also reported that uh, it's done at a fairly uh, you know comparable false positive rates then you have something called the calling behavior calling behavior is because again today we are talking about uh, you know uh, the explosion in uh, the cellular technology people are talking about uh, 4g 5g's and so on and uh, like you know communications and with the with the, with the increase in all these uh, technologies again the, you know uh, uh, the communication companies are still faced with uh, uh, problems or challenges of what is known as fraudulent uh, calling activities so in order to actually uh, detect what is known as the theft or uh, services many of the companies are getting into or turning into what is called as behavioral user profiling so behavioral user profiling with the hope that you know they'll be able to uh, hold on to some unusual patterns and because of these unusual patterns they'll be able to stop the fraud at the earliest as possible so this is how they are actually go, you know going to what is called as the behavioral user profiling so because when we when we when we typically uh, when when we uh, when we typically understand this particular system this system typically works by generating what is known as a user calling profile so in this case a user calling profile is created so this user calling profile would consist of indicators such as the date the time of the call the duration the caller id the call number the cost of the call the number of calls to the local destinations and the mobile uh, calls to the uh, mobile destination number of calls to the international destinations and all these things so all these things can be uh, tied to what is known as the user calling profile and again one of the researchers have shown that they have used neural networks and they have applied uh, neural networks to very su such a uh, feature space and were able to uh, detect uh, what is known as the fraud and also another researchers as early as in 1997 they have shown that they have used what is called as a, a rule based methods or rule based programs to discover patterns from uh, a very large databases of customer transactions so this this is how a calling behavior profile can be created uh, based on uh, features uh, available uh, and this how this could be an example of what is called as the the behavioral uh, user behavioral uh, uh, biometrics then a very important thing you know uh, people are talking about uh, car driving style in autonomous vehicles like uh, uh, most of the us cities you know now they have autonomous vehicles just imagine autonomous vehicle you you just imagine you are getting into an autonomous vehicle car and the car will be able to uh, because you know like most of the cars today uh, I read an ad in the newspaper saying that you know most of the cars today are fitted with AI. So just imagine AI is uh, is part of the car culture now. So just uh, you know just imagine if the car was able to understand, uh, or there is a concept called as uh, the personalized cars. There is a concept called as personalized cars. That means the moment you enter, suppose your car is driven by your wife, so the car will understand. Okay, this is not Anil or this is somebody else, and then accordingly varies the features. And varies the features, right? So that is amazing. Similarly, if it is Anil, so that means the car will understand this is this vehicle is driven by Anil, and therefore his uh, parameters are this because based on his driving style, you know the car may be able to understand. Okay, this is the person, and this is not the person that you know was regularly driving. And at the same time, most of the cases of uh, theft, most of the cases of you know 
the other kind of incidents like for example a driver dozing off uh, while driving or it could be something like you know a person uh, drinking uh, too much of alcohol and wanting to drive all these things can be addressed uh, based on a simple uh, you know a trait of what is known as the car driving style so car driving style has become one of the very interesting feature uh, behavioral biometrics that can be that is definitely uh, and definitely used in what is known as the autonomous vehicles and uh, there is something you know this is also i was fascinated to understand you know there was something called this there is a research there have been people there have been people working on these kind of research you know i was totally uh, i was totally under, i mean you know, I, I i couldn't understand this you know just imagine like uh, every day uh, i don't know most of us today they use what is called as uh, the windows machine okay so before windows machine like if in case you were uh, if you are if you are aware uh, people used to use the dos machines and then there most of the times you need to uh, give commands like you know most of the focus, suppose if in case you want to uh, you know run a file or if you want to copy a file or if you want to do any kind of an activity what you need to do is you need to type a command so say for example uh, prn or it could be something like cat or it could be something like copy you need to you need to give commands now i was understanding how somebody can you know how somebody can create uh, 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 can how can somebody can uh, you know come out with something called the behavioral traits based on these commands so the the researcher what he has done here is the researchers has you know they they say that you know every day most of the users most many of the users they actually if they are if at all they are using commands because when we talk about commands most of the commands are by and large used in unix platform okay so today you have what is known as the graphical user interface uh, platforms in the form of ubuntu or it could be windows but by and large if somebody still in today still when somebody is working on network or somebody working on the consoles they still use what is known as the the command prompts or see called as a cli so they st they still use commands now a profile can be created now a command line profile can be created based on the usage of the commands so that means for example if there is a worker a network administrator a network administrator will come on uh, every day he will come to a particular a uh, network center and he will use a set of commands to understand the working of the network in a, on a day to day basis right so uh, if that particular worker is addressed as a so a profile of a is created because a is more likely to use only these kind of commands and uh, you know so that is that is that is the knowledge that uh, this researchers have used in order to come out with what is known as the command line profile of the uh, of the users and use that as a behavioral metric, uh, behavioral uh, uh, metrics or uh, to identify whether there is a set of commands that are executed beyond what is considered to be normal Uh, for example if somebody is uh, you know somebody logs into a particular network and tries to uh, disrupt uh, uh, the services so basically he will try to do uh, you know he will try to execute commands other than the normal profile based kind of commands so therefore this is also taken as one of the example by the researcher to show that this can also be one of the very important behavioral tricks then uh, you have something called the the credit card use so credit card again uh, the way that you use the credit cards uh, i think most of us would be very familiar with this like for example uh, every often now uh, we hear in the <clears throat> we hear in the media or we read in the newspaper saying that uh, you know somebody was conned uh, by you know with the credit card fraud and uh, they found that the credit card was used in brazil or it could be in nigeria and so on that means uh, based on some kind of what is known as the transaction that is not normal like for example normal transaction we know for sure uh, what is the limit that we would uh, we would actually uh, do but when we have some abnormal kind of which we call as outliers outliers of the data points so these outliers of data points can be considered again here in this case when we talk about the credit card as a point of view so these outliers of which which could be something like you know uh, a fraud that is com committed uh, uh, far away from geographical locations 
or at multiple locations all these can be considered as outliers and they can be uh, considered as uh, uh, as an event that could uh, uh, that could be that could be uh, uh, you know detected by the system uh, to know uh, uh, the 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 uh, the event such as the fraud being ha uh, fraud ha happening then uh, there is something called the evil email behavior so email you uh, know i was also you know when i was reading this uh, to be honest how email sending of email can be also one of the uh, you know behavioral biometrics then you know uh, this really made sense to me because uh, you you know you think uh, because you know uh, the authors you know who have done this research has done it in a very good way and they have also showcased in a very better way they say that you know how you send an email uh, you know based on that we can have we can create a, what is known as the uh, email profile of a user so we create an email profile of a user and then we can say that whether this particular uh, email is a genuine email or whether it is a what is known as not so genuine or a fake kind of an email so that means uh, based on the attributes of emails like for example you know uh, it could be something like uh, uh, whether you, uh, you know, uh, 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 whether you send, uh, you know, uh, a typical example I can say is uh, uh, whether, you know, when we are sending an email, uh, we will not send an email uh, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to a particular, say, for example, to my wife. I will send an email to my wife and the same email may not be sent to uh, everybody, right? Because when you send an email to your wife, it will be personal. And uh, this personal information may not be sent to uh, the others as well. So just imagine today we are receiving so many emails uh, to everybody. So that means we receive the common mails to everybody. So that can also be a very important thing that we need to note whether that could be a, 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 a really a genuine email or it could be a what's known as the a fake kind of an email that's being sent. Now why all these things are important because you know when we talk about uh, security okay when we talk about security so all these things become uh, very important because uh, email behavior can also be analyzed uh, you know because emails are sent from multiple places multiple locations to multiple recipients and uh, you know they can be addressed to they can be they can you know sometimes emails are also carriers of uh, malicious uh, programs so therefore uh, what you need to do with that whether you need to take it or whether you need to drop it so all these things becomes very important from the point of security. So therefore, email behavior can also be considered as one of the very important behavioral traits uh, to 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 uh, you know uh, to uh, prevent uh, uh, what is known as a malicious kind of an attack attack happening uh, either to a system or to a network. So again, uh, the authors I have uh, here in this case again some of the research authors. Uh, they have uh, used what is known as some of the uh, text uh, textual features, you know, like some of the textual features, like some uh, common uh, techniques that they use for text analytics. And they have also used with something called uh, the the email structure, like, for example, uh, they have HTML tags and then uh, there is something called the greetings and all that. So they've used all these things in order to arrive uh, in order to arrive with their, uh, you know, uh, the conclusion, but one cl one conclusion that they have uh, seen, uh, one conclusion that they have drawn, is that uh, they have almost 200 features that they have used for this experiment, and they say that uh, most of the features that they think is valid for text-based kind of work may not be good enough for what is known as the email kind of a uh, domain because email happens to be. Uh, what is known as a shorter average size kind of a communication, which reminds me of something like, you know, which reminds me of something like when we talk about Twitter. So Twitter is basically 140 characters or 170 characters. And, uh, you know, uh, probably uh, 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 and it contains a lot of information which would be meaningful and which would not be meaningful. So sometimes uh, when we apply one technique to these 140 characters, and when we try to apply the same to a blog or it could be uh, you know any other uh, uh, the any other uh, web page or website maybe you know there would be some kind of uh, what is known as 
the drop in the performance. So that is what you know uh, the author is trying to say here. The author is trying to say that you know uh, whatever features that they have tried to explore uh, during the course of the experiment, and they found that some of them are definitely not uh, applicable or useful in the email context. Then uh, you have something called the the gate. So gate is basically something called you know I think. Uh, uh, you have been talking about gate or people have been talking about gate and all that so I know you know about it so basically the movement how you actually you know uh, how uh, how you actually move and this movement can be subjected to a lot of variation it could be because of uh, you know the person's body weight during the course of time or it could be uh, injuries that he has sustained or it could be you know uh, some kind of intoxication uh, that he uh, he would have been uh, subjected to so all these things can actually uh, bring in some kind of a variation and this could be some kind of a challenge as well so this is also considered to be one of the important uh, behavioral uh, metrics so i think i'll not be discussing more about it because uh, there are plenty of uh, resource persons i think who could have uh, covered or would be covering in the uh, next course of uh, uh, the uh, the course. Then you have something called the the graphical user interface interaction. So uh, you know uh, a graphical user interface is because you know if you remember we did talk about the command line and now we are talking about something called the graphical user inter interaction. The idea is basically you know just to monitor uh, the keyboard and the mouse activity. So uh, when you are moving it, like for example. Uh, when you are using a mouse, when you are uh, moving across the screen, and when you are pressing the appropriate buttons, it could be something like uh, the left click, the right click. So all these things are definite indicators, uh, definite uh, pointers uh, to understand uh, the behavior of uh, what is known as the user. So this is what exactly is uh, mentioned by a researcher. And uh, this particular researcher, Garg et al., so he has come out with uh, a kind of a system and that particular system, uh, it records all possible user activities on the systems, including uh, uh, the system background process, including what is known as what kind of user commands were run, keyboard activities, mouse clicks, and so on. And all these collected information is timestamped and pre-processed uh, pre to reduce the amount of uh, data uh, that can be uh, used for intrusion detection purposes. So this is also uh, considered to be one of the important uh, the trait in uh, the intrusion detection uh, 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 the area. Then you have something called the, the keystroke dynamics. Uh, again, when we talk about the keystroke uh, dynamics, uh, like uh, uh, typing patterns can be also one of the important characteristics of uh, each person. Uh, some people are experienced typists and are utilizing only the touch typing method and the others, they also, they have something called the hunt and peck approach. So they use only the two fingers. So uh, so the difference, so the, these differences make uh, verification of people based on their typing patterns a, a kind of possibilities. And uh, and some reports also suggest that the ident identification is also possible. So uh, likewise, you know, uh, different uh, keystroke features uh, based on time durations uh, between the keystroke, inter keystrokes. And all these things are overall typing speed, frequency of errors, use of numpad, and how many times a user presses the shift key, how many times he uses the capital, uh, you know, uh, the letters. All these are considered as one of the important uh, uh, characteristics in order to uh, differentiate uh, uh, different users. Okay, so uh, then there is something called the heptic. Heptics are basically uh, computers, uh, you know, systems, the heptic systems are basically a computer input and output device, which provide us some information about the direction, the pressure, and the force, and angle, the speed, and position of the user interaction. So that is, uh, uh, you know, that, that was recorded by the researcher in 2005 and 6. So uh, this, this researcher created what is known as a simple heptic application uh, built on what is known as an elastic membrane surface in which the user is required to navigate a stylus through the maze. And uh, the maze had some kind of a gummy walls and a stretchy floor. So the application collects the ability of the user to navigate through what is known as the maze. Uh, and it was able to understand uh, the reaction time 
to release from the sticky wall, the route uh, traveled, the velocity, the pressure, and so on. So these are uh, uh, the, the 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 features that were actually captured, and then uh, from these uh, captured features, individual profiles were created, and these individual profiles were created, and then you know, so they were able to uh, identify. Uh, identify uh, the subject based on these individual uh, characteristics. In a separate experiment that was conducted by one of the researcher in 2005, they implemented what is called as the virtual mobile phone application, where the user interacts through what is called as an haptic pen to simulate the making of a phone call via a touchpad. So the keystroke duration, the pen's position, the force that is exerted, they were used as what is known as uh, the important features for what is known as the user profiling. Then uh, there is something called the lip movement. So when we talk about the lip movement, uh, this particular approach was originally based on uh, visual speech reading technology. Uh, you know, uh, 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 that is basically uh, attempted to actually uh, capture uh, a person during uh, the speech and uh, you know some of the some of the uh, some of the models are constructed around what is known as the spatial uh, temporarily a uh, temporal uh, lip features so in this case what happens is the lip region is first is, is, is to be isolated from the video feed and then the significant features of the lip contours are extra are extracted from the edges and the gradients so lip features include uh, the opening of the mouth, the closing, the skin around uh, the lips, mouth width, and so on. All these things are taken up and, lipical, uh, and uh, typically lip dynamics are used as what is known as a part of multimodal biometric system. So they are, not, they, uh, they are used along with other biometric systems. Then we have something called the, the network traffic. So when we talk about the network traffic, uh, uh, when we talk about the network traffic, so this network traffic uh, intrusion detection is somewhat different from the intrusion that happens, uh, you know, is somewhat is somewhat different from the intrusion uh, that can be monitored because network intrusion happens somewhere outside, and it's it becomes very difficult to monitor. Now, uh, uh, with the increase in what is called as the internet and the other kind of networks, intruder has, uh, you know, intruder has no longer have an access to the system that he's trying to penetrate, uh, he's trying to get in. So uh, this means that the network that is arriving from different system ports, because every we know for sure that the data will be coming from different, uh, different system ports, and they would be encoded using different protocols. All these things, it could be system ports or it could be different protocols. All these two, uh, all these are required to be processed and reviewed. Now, the IDS, that is intrusion detection system. So predominantly, you know, again, in this case, we create a profile. We create a profile of a user or a behavioral pattern of the user based on his network uh, usage or a network parameters usage. Now, again, this is a, one of the typical applications where this kind of profiling would become very useful is intrusion detection system. So in this case, the intrusion detection case, the uh, you know, the traffic is analyzed for various uh, attributes like, for example, what kind of protocol is being followed. It could be IP protocol, if in case, what kind of IP protocol type, values that, that it does have, what is the packet size, uh, and then what was the server port number that was used, and what was the source and the destination uh, protocol prefixes uh, it, it has, and what is the time to live values, what is the header length, and what are the incorrect TCP, IP, UDP checksums, and also on. So these are the different parameters that aid in coming out with what is called as the user profile, especially identifying a genuine user uh, based on the the traffic pattern of the network. Okay, so. Uh, during uh, what is known as the baseline. So that means we know for, for sure what exactly is a baseline. So during the baseline profiling period, so that means I have to establish that, yes, this is the normal course of uh, the packets. This is the normal uh, flow of packets. This is the normal kind of packets. So during the baseline period, profiling period, so number of packets with each attribute value is countered and then 
they are considered as a normal behavior that is again that's how they profile something as normal and something as abnormal a behavior and again any deviation from the abnormal behavior will set a uh, set uh, what is known as the a uh, flag will alert a flag informing what is known as the network administrator about an attack that is taking place and so on so many behavior based security systems were developed on the concept of network level attack detection and the general area of network analysis is also applicable for improved network and network application design so uh, i think you know uh, from uh, there are a couple of uh, more uh, uh, examples that i wish to give you so from the discussions that we were we are ha uh, we are having so uh, what it uh, what it implies is that it shows that you know we have something called you know uh, the biometrics and when we talk about biometrics it is not the only biometrics that i'm aware of there is something that is different like you know uh there is something that is different and there is something that needs to be that needs to be identified like for example when we when we you know we we talked about something called the email a uh, profiling so i mean why email profiling how somebody can identify a person somebody how somebody can identify a person or how somebody can identify the traffic as genuine or not so genuine and how in this case for example network traffic uh, in this case so how it's possible to uh, you know uh, get on to different parameters of uh, the packets or the uh, or the data that is uh, coming from the network how the different parameters that make up the data can be utilized in coming out with what is called as a behavioral uh, a profile of the user and based on the behavioral profile of the user you will be able to identify what is known as Uh, whether the traffic is suspicious or whether traffic is a uh, genuine or it could be a benign kind of a traffic so these are some of the takeaways probably you know we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, gone uh, uh, so far uh, from the examples that i have tried to convey uh, from uh, the uh, a couple of uh, uh, previous slides just moving on i have some more examples which i want to share you because the the idea here is you know the idea is we need to know like what are the areas or what are the applications where this particular uh, behavioral biometric can be used okay so the idea is that it's not only you know uh, to give you an exposure to a pro probably you know i'm not saying that i'll be able to give you the entire exposure no it's not possible so i'll be able to give you a highlight into what is known as the areas that we can always explore for example if somebody wants to use uh, you know behavioral biometrics in the area of uh, network or somebody wants to use uh, behavioral biometrics in the area of uh, uh, the data analytics all these things is an open avenue right so this gives you an exposure so that's the only intent for me to cover uh, these examples from the uh, few, last few slides so again going by there is something a very interesting one more uh, you know example that's called as programming style so how programming style can be an important uh, bi behavioral biometrics so this is again you know now uh, you see that there are number of uh, at a number of things happening like for example it could be the number of viruses coming up the worms the uh, trojan horse and so many things now this kind of thing would be very useful for uh, forensics uh, people dealing with forensics because they need to identify Oh, who this particular you know for example somebody if somebody develops an uh, worm or uh, what is known as the viruses the forensic team will be will be interested to know who is the identity would be who's the author of this particular uh, program and so on so that you know naturally they could take uh, the course of action but uh, this itself can be a very interesting channel uh, a challenge in addition to not only identity of the uh, subject or the author it could be something like it could be useful for the purpose of what is known as the software debugging and maintenance okay in addition to identifying the author of the uh, this particular program it is also useful for debugging and maintenance of that particular program one of the researcher you know as early as uh, 1992 so he says that you know he has actually analyzed the number of uh, features and uh, number of features and uh, he says that Uh, it was these features would be useful for identifying the author of the particular software 
but there are some challenges like suppose if you have only executable code okay so when you have only executable code so the author says the data structure and the applied algorithms can be profiled so that means you have only executable code so you need to make a profile of it so data structure and applied algorithms can be profiled as well as any remaining compiler and system information observed programming skill level the knowledge of the operating system and the choice of system calls utilized so these are the observations that is given by the author as early as in 1992 so he says that if it is only executable word so these are the analysis probable uh, potential analysis that could be made and i believe that this would have changed or probably this would be added on that like that there would be more number of features that would be added on here and additionally he says that most of the users who are the authors who create this kind of code they would be using a different predefined functions and also the way they handle error handling functions could be also different so therefore based on these traits it's possible to distinguish one programmer with respect to the other programmer so this was an example with respect to what is called as the executable code now when he says that suppose you are given the original source file so you have the original files with you so then in this case what are the different uh, you know features that you can actually explore so according to the author he says uh, the, the 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 choice of the programming language the the coding format that is used the type of the code editor that is used and if there is any macro that is used and the style of comments uh that is uh, you know uh, that uh, that was introduced the variable names that was actually used the spelling and the grammars the use of language features and also use of uh, features especially the choice of using the looping statements so those things can also be uh, different and also he says the ratio of global to local variables and the coding structure and, and in addition to it very interestingly he says the number of mistakes that he makes in the code so these can be what is known as some of the uh, features uh, that can be identified or some of the features that can be profiled to identify uh, 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 you know of this particular uh, uh, the program that was written okay so in addition to it there are other people who have said that in addition we can use what is known as the number of lines of code that is used per function uh, comments to code ratio function complexity all these things can be also discussed so these are some of the you know uh, you know some of the profile that can be that we can that we can create based on what the programming style then uh, probably again uh, i'll i'll take a couple of uh, i'll take uh, what is known as a couple of more examples because i am not through uh, what i want to discuss but i want to discuss uh, these things and then get on to what is known as the social behavioral biometrics but let me uh, you know do it, uh, i'll take uh, uh, probably uh, two or three examples still more and then i'll jump on to what is known as social behavioral biometrics this again is very important we know what is registry access right we know for example registry we have heard about the windows registry server registry and so on according to another researcher one of the researchers he says that he has uh, proposed what is known as a new type of host based security approach we call them as call registry anomaly detection it's called as rad so the objective of this particular study that he has proposed is to monitor the usage of the windows registry now we know for sure what is windows registry windows registry is basically very important because it gives information about the hardware installed and uh, which port is being used and the profile of the user policies usernames passwords configuration settings of the programs all this is stored in what is known as the windows registry now most of the prog uh, most of the programs that we uh, normally uh, you know try to run or access they actually access only a set of registry keys during the normal uh, operations okay during the normal operation they will op only operate a set, set of uh, registry keys but uh, you know uh, uh, so this when, when this is done uh, when when this is done uh, in a, a normal due course of time so the degree of regularity in the registry interaction is high because you know this is how the normal programs would be executing and uh, we know for sure that only these uh, uh, 
uh, what is known as the set of registry keys would be used quite often. But when uh, malicious software uh, tries to uh, take over and tries to deviate from this regular activity, so this can be detected because uh, you know suddenly you know uh, this malicious software tries to use keys which may not be used in a regular which will not be used uh, regularly and it may try to uh, attempt change things which was not done before or periodically so all these things can be considered as something like an abnormal behavior or abnormal trait and this can alert uh, the system administrator uh, uh, about this kind of an attack happening at the registry level. So this is also a kind, okay, the, uh, the what is known as the explanation or the features that are used is very minimal, but hopefully this gives you an idea how, uh, you know, behavioral patterns can be created at the registry level. Then you have something called the signature and handwriting. So I think most of the speakers would have spoken about signature and handwriting. So I'll not be talking about the signature and handwriting, how they could be a very important uh, behavioral biometric uh, trait. So I'll not be talking about this. So you would be having, I think uh, the speaker would have spoken about it or maybe in the due course of time. So there'll be uh, some more speakers will be talking about it. Yeah. Uh, talking about something like a storage because today people are talking about cloud people are talking about you know big data people are talking about you know uh, what do you call as uh, uh, story uh, san there is storage here in networks so you have a network of storage and so on so many things like uh, you know it's quite possible that uh, you know uh, this storage activity can also have some kind of issues like for example many of the intruders many actions of the intruders become visible at the storage level interface and manipulation of system utilities, tempering of audit logs, resetting of attributes and addition of suspicious content. All these things, <coughs> all these things will show some kind of changes in the storage layer of the system. Now, when we talk about the storage based security system, the storage based security system will analyze all the requests received from the storage server and can issue an alert about the suspicious activity to the system administrator. So based on that, it can slow down, it can slow down the suspected intruder's storage, or it can isolate the intruder, or it can send him to what is known as a sandbox area. So these kind of activities can be done based on the activities that happened in the, the storage based security system. Now, the storage based security system has an advantage when compared to the client operating system, because when we talk about storage and client storage is something you know, it's very comprehensive. And when you talk about uh, the what is called as the client, so client is, you know, it's individual. So uh, this is comprehensive. This is individual. So when we so when an attack happens in the uh, comprehensive environment, uh, the, the attack will not contain or will not stop the entire working of uh, these storage systems. No, only one part will be affected and uh, then the remaining, you know, the remaining will understand about it and they will continue to work. But when, when you talk about individual uh, systems, so the individual system will have a maximum effect because that particular system will shut down and, you know, it will not work. So that's how the storage based security systems will have an independent, uh, will have an advantage compared to the individual client operating systems. So research in this particular area is also uh, is also progressing, and uh, so with the lot of uh, you know uh, in a lot of uh, papers being published, and also innovation taking place at different uh, levels. It could be at the storage level, or it could be the SAN level, or it could be the workstation, or the cloud, and so on. Then you have something called the system calls. So when I say system calls, system call is basically a method uh, we know for sure. Uh, used by a program to request a service from the operating systems or particularly the operating system kernel. So system calls use special instructions which cause the processor to transfer the control to the more privileged core segment. So intruder detection can be achieved by comparing uh, application runtime with the predefined normal system calls behavior model. So this, the assumption here is that as long as the intruder can make arbitrary system calls, it is unlikely that he can achieve his desired malicious code. So that is again one of the researchers who have quoted. And at the same time, uh, there are a couple of researchers who say that 
uh, uh, model of normal uh, call behavior is learned during the training phase, uh, which is a baseline and, uh, and also assumed to be free of attacks. And alternative approaches use what is called as a stack analysis of the source code or a binary code. So a number of representation schema or schemas for behavioral model has been proposed, including what is called as the finite automata, push down automata, and so on. OK, again, uh, voice and speech and singing. Again, this is uh, one of the very interesting thing, but I'll not be talking about it. Again, we know for sure this is also one of the very be best researched uh, biometric technologies where verification is based on the speaker's ana anatomical structures conveyed in uh, the amplitude spectrum with location and size of the spectral peaks uh, related to vocal tract, shape, and pitch of the styrations related to glottal source of the so uh, source of the users, and so on. So this is also one of the very interesting area of research uh, that people have talked about. So I think there'll be uh, one of the one of the speakers will be talking on it. So I'll not be you know going uh, anything. Uh, I'll not be talking about this uh, a, uh, anymore. So I'll just move on to the next one. So you know probably uh, my discussion. I don't know maybe whether you followed it, but I believe that you know uh, the the previous discussion. Uh, I have given you a probably. Uh, you know, an example, a comprehensive example of, uh, of different things that are relevant to cyberspace, starting from what is called as an audit log and all the way to what is called as, uh, all the way to what is called as uh, the voice or speech signal. Okay, so probably uh, this would have helped you to understand uh, uh, the significance of behavioral biometrics, how behavioral biometrics can also be one of the important feature that could be used with the traditional biometrics to achieve its, uh, you know, to achieve uh, the best performance of uh, the system that you want to develop. Okay. So having said that, then uh, we, I, I, I was fascinated with one more term, and that is what we call as the social behavioral biometrics. This social behavioral <coughs> biometrics uh, the term was coined in 2014. So 2014, uh, this particular term started uh, making rounds in the, the internet. Now, what exactly uh, this? We'll just talk about it. See, majority of the existing behavioral biometrics are either based on human computer interaction or measuring body parts and muscle actions. That's what is the research talks about. And in uh, 2014, one of the authors, they proposed what is called as the social behavioral biometrics. Now, this particular author classifies the existing behavioral biometrics into two categories. One, mission independent human behavior. And the other one is what is called as mission dependent human behavior. So most of the early works uh, in this uh, behavioral biometrics fall under the category of what is called as mission independent category, which predominantly talks about signature, voice, and gait. Okay, this mission dependent behavioral biometrics are emerging and fast growing uh, field of uh, research uh, because of, you know, too many things like it could be one of the major reason is security requirements in the cyber world. One of the major thing is security requirements in the cyber world. Now, as I've told you, wide range of applications of computing devices and softwares users interact with the machines in many ways. A wide range of behavioral biometrics have been proposed on human interaction with machines uh, during the last few years. Typing pattern of an individual, mouse dynamics, touch screens, interaction of uh, the individuals using uh, keystroke. These are all the things that we have seen in the earlier slides, which could be a, which are a good example of what is called as the behavioral biometrics. Now, most of these works are based on individuals, idols syncartic way of interaction, which simply means, you know, individuals unique way of interaction, unique because everybody has its their unique way of interaction with input devices, and they do not consider very importantly, the knowledge, intelligence or interest of the user. So therefore, research have revealed that human behaviors are strongly dominated by skills, intelligence and interest exhibited by a a strong personal characteristics as well. So a recent study has shown that recent study have a recent study has shown a recent study published by one of the researcher in 2013 has shown that 
idiosyncratic behavioral patterns are very high in the case of users web browsing style that is users uh, they have their unique patterns or unique behavioral uh, patterns uh, when it comes to what is known as the web browsing or their style of web browsing now, so from uh, the discussions that we had we come to understand that the human interaction activities contain unique personal characteristics which can help authentication in both real and cyber world so human activities are not just limited to something like uh, you know walking or gaming or typing but also one of the very important thing is how you interact that is social interaction social interaction is also very has become indispensable part of the human behavior and now in the era of what is called as the social networking every uh, every social interaction have been naturally extended into uh, virtual space as well so therefore we say social behavior of an individual can be a very useful a very important resource for an individual from the point from that this point of view so according to uh, the author who has proposed uh, you know who proposed uh, what is known as uh, who started working on social behavior so they define social behavioral biometrics as identification of an actor so when we say identification of an actor in the social context it could be identification of a person or his avatar right based on their social interaction and communication in different social setting so this is the definition that is given by one of the researcher and that is with respect to what is known as the social behavioral biometrics let me define it once again for you social behavioral biometrics is basically an identification of an actor based on their social interaction and communication in different social settings when we talk about the social settings the social settings can be divided into two groups one is the online and the other one is the offline so we know for sure when we talk about an online so there are all these platforms that come into picture like for example it could be online forums instant messages social networks virtual games chat rooms and so on and when we talk about something like offline it talks about remote collaboration work uh, face to face communication meeting family environment uh, recreation center and etc and etc so this is how you know the social setting is uh, grouped into online and offline some of these uh, sbb features that is when i say sbb it stands for social biometrical uh, social behavioral biometrics social behavioral biometrics features can be used for persons verification and identification in many ways and to just give an example you know uh, the person communicates to his family member could be different uh from the way he talks in the meeting and such interaction that is such unique way of interaction of a person can be used to identify his identity in a social setting okay so in a social setting it's it's very useful so an example of application that could be used for user verification in online social networking sites could be the traditional way of user uh, uh, <clears throat> the traditional way of user verification is to use the username the password security questions and also trying to remember the security questions and their answer can be you know can be a uh, little difficult so that is a traditional way but when we talk about the sbb that is uh, the social behavioral biometrics so sbb features can be obtained from the social networking sites and they can contain important information about the users and some of the security questions can be auto generated based on that information to verify a user from that particular social networking site so this is how one kind of modification one kind of uniqueness that can be brought in with the use of what is called as sbb compared to that of the traditional way of doing verification so the the advantage of this is this would increase the security to the user's account in sns as well as it will also help relieve the user of uh, users from remembering what is known as the username and the password and also more importantly the uh, security question sbb features can be applied not only to uh, you know uh, the a, a kind of uh, a static kind of an authentication it can also be applied for continuous kind of an authentication which is very very significant in the cyberspace because cyberspace is dynamic so you cannot just uh, you know allow authentication to happen at one time and then let it go 
because authentication need to be on a timely basis. So therefore, we say SBB features can be applied on a continuous manner uh, uh, in the cyberspace. And one promising application that could be a continuous authentication is social online networking platform. Just imagine uh, when somebody attacks one user account and uh, once uh, the user account is hacked or compromised, but then what happens is the friends list and the resources available in that particular uh, uh, the, the friend or that particular uh, account will also be compromised. So therefore, in order to prevent, in order to have these, uh, you know, things to, uh, you know, from the, the, not to prevent these things from happening. So uh, it's proposed that instead of going with what is called as a static or one time kind of an authentication, users can go with what is called as, uh, you know, a continuous uh, authentication based on social behavioral biometric features. That is, say, for example, at any point of time, if the system feels that, you know, the trust level, the trust level drops. Now, what do you mean by trust? You are using uh, the social networking site and, you know, based on the actions of the user on the networking side, a trust is established, correct? So that means profiling. So based on the profiling, if at any point of time, if the, if, uh, the system detects that this is an unusual profile, so that means the trust level drops. When the trust level drops, what happens is the system can take necessary actions. How does it take necessary actions? It can prevent the user from using or continuing further, or it can prevent the user from using the services or the resources. And at the same time, it can also help generate an alarm. And this alarm can help uh, uh, the administrator as at the same time the user uh, uh, know that something is not correct with their account. Okay, so that's how the, uh, the continuous uh, authentication using what is known as uh, the SBB can be very useful. Research has shown that, you know, in many cases, uh, a, a multimodal biometrics can be very, very interesting and can be very advantageous compared to that of a single biometrics. So therefore, SBB features can also be uh, used what is known as a part of the multimodal or multifactor authentications. So integrating SBB features as also can be thought of as one of the one of the modalities along with other uh, biological uh, other uh, biometric traits that it could be physiological uh, traits can uh, you know pro can increase the recognition rate okay so these are some of the uh, some of the application where the sbp features can be used quite effectively now this is also one of the uh, 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 framework that was proposed by the author so in this case you know, the idea is every activity that we undertake uh, in the social media leaves us large amount of what is known as the behavioral footprints. So we need to identify these behavioral footprints and uh, that are very difficult to fake. OK, so therefore, uh, this was one of the models that was proposed uh, by the author and it's called as a unimodal framework. So it consists of what it consists of the social media. Uh, you have different platforms. And then uh, you have uh, the normal, uh, you know, because any uh, learning algorithms uh, states, you have what is known as the training and the testing kind of a scenario here. And if you look very carefully, so you have uh, uh, at, the, at, the at the training phase, you have uh, three types of information that is fed, basically comprising of profile, the network, and the communication. So these are the three types of information that is fed. And from these type of information, uh, they get different features. It could be something called the knowledge features, the style based features and the statistical features. And they get what is known as based on these, uh, the author is proposing what is called as the SBB profile. That is a social behavioral biometric profile. So based on the knowledge, based on the style and based on the statistical features. Okay. So the same thing is basically again, uh, for testing, uh, you know, we use uh, for testing purposes, the same thing is used. And then, you know, finally, uh, there's a score obtained and based on the score, the identity of a subject is established. So when we talk about this particular uh, framework, so three things became very, uh, uh, very uh, eminent. One is prominent. One is the profile. The other one is the network. And the, the third one is the communication. So when we talk about the profile, so profile is basically some static information. It could be something like the name, affiliation, the location, address, job, personal page, and so on. So these are some of the 
the attributes that is uh, taken by the researcher as far as the profile information is concerned. But when we when she, when, she, when she talks about the network information, so network information talks about like uh, the connections, like for example, who are the friends, the groups she is part of, the communities, the or the memberships, the followers, and so on. And when 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 when, when they talk about something called the community uh, communicative information, so communicative information can be like the microblogs, tweets, replies, retweets, tags, comments, shared URLs. All these things are part of what is called as the communicative information. So when we talk, when we just, you know, when we just go a little, uh, little, uh, not deeper, but when we go a little further, we say that, you know, the, uh, we see that there is something called knowledge-based feature, knowledge-based, uh, knowledge-based feature. So what is that? What exactly is this knowledge-based feature, uh, features? Uh, the knowledge-based knowledge about a person's behavior can be discovered by mining the social data. Uh, by mining the social data from user profile, network, and communication in the social media. For example, a user's, uh, user's friend list can be obtained by analyzing whom the user is frequently communicating or consistently communicating with. In this way, again, mining the social data might reveal valuable information about users such as the personal interest, community, travel information, and so on. So this information can be used with what is called as the soft biometrics in person identification. In addition, some of the patterns of interaction can be explored by analyzing the social data over time and can be used for feature sets to identify or verify the person's identity. So when we talk about the style uh, based features, uh, like for example, they are well known features for authors attribution from writing samples in the forensic application. So a few studies have also proposed to use stylometry on social media communication to find uh, the unique way of communication of the person uh, to a specific uh, friend or a group of people. So these style based features have to be selected corresponding to different application because when we talk about what is known as uh, the, the social networking sites, style varies. And today, most of the uh, users who are using, uh, you know, uh, the social networking sites, they have their own way of communication. They use different kinds of uh, style based features, be it like emote icons or be it like uh, in lexicons or punctuations, abbreviations, spelling mistakes, frequent spelling mistakes, salutations, signatures, and so on. So all these could be one of the challenges that one user would or one researcher could face when he is trying to analyze or use what is known as a style based features for what is known as uh, analyzing the uh, analyzing uh, uh, the user okay analyzing the user from the context of sbb similarly again you have something called the frequency based features when we say uh, when we talk about the frequency based features frequency based features are statistical information which can be extracted from the communication of the user which again uh, to give an example number of microblogs number of comments number of tweets replies state uh, status updates tags and so on so these could be uh, uh, you know examples of what is known as the frequency based features similarly the author also has proposed what is called as the multimodal framework now in this multimodal framework the author has also suggested that you know uh, physiological biometrics can also be a part of or can be also used with what is known as the uh, social uh, uh, behavioral biometrics so this is also one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, proposed uh, framework that is proposed by the the researcher uh, with an objective to enhance what is called as the identification performance and at the same time also address what is known as the user acceptability uh, acceptability level Okay, so having gone through what is known as, uh, you know, uh, 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 just an, uh, to, uh, what is known as a different, uh, what is called as the social behavioral biometrics, having gone through what exactly is social behavioral biometrics and what constitutes social behavioral biometrics, let's try to, uh, 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 let's try to, you know, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, can I, am I running out of time? It's okay, sir. Uh, you can take another 10 minutes also. Okay, okay. So I'll just quickly run through the uh, case studies. So when we talk about the case study, you know, uh, we have something called the sentiment analysis, how sentiment analysis and social behavior can be used to detect cyber attacks. So let's try to understand that. 
Now, basically, again, uh, we know the significance of social media, so I don't have to talk about uh, the social media and so on. But one thing that makes us interesting is sentiments. Now, these sentiments, because when we talk about social media, social media is the, uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of sentiments that are expressed and therefore sentiment polarity can be used as a sensor to analyze what is known as the social behavior of uh, users on social media as an indicator for what is called as cyber attack behavior. For example, extreme negative sentiments towards a particular organization can indicate what is known as a high probability of it being a target of cyber attack. One good example that we can talk about is, you know, recently a French teacher was actually, you know, beheaded. So it was done by one 18 year old uh, uh, student. So that was by because, you know, there was some kind of a campaign. It's called as an angry campaign on the social media before this particular event occurred. So which means that there was a lot of hatred. There's a lot of negative sentiments before this particular event took place. Similarly, uh, sentiment, measuring this sentiment itself is very difficult because one, the data is very difficult to get and uh, moreover, the data is not labeled, labeled in the sense whether it is, uh, you know, whether it is positive, negative or whether it is, you know, all those things are not labeled. And the other thing is, um, we are faced with what is known as too much of noisy kind of a data. So that is whatever data that's available, it's too noisy. Uh, you have uh, spelling mistakes, you have uh, what is known as punctuation mistakes, you have a lot of, you know, all these things are there. So that is also one of the interesting challenges that we have when we talk about social media and especially trying to understand the sentiment part of it. In addition to it, some of the observation that was reported in the literature is this. Before an attack could happen, the sentiment score was relatively stable. Okay, so that is the that is the uh, report that is that published. So before any attack, the sentiment score is normal. And during while well, several days before the attack, so that is uh, building up to the attack, the sentiment scores are strongly negative, and which may again gets reflected in the public's unsatisfaction towards a particular event or it could indicate some kind of an attack. So, so that means you can see that pattern. Initially, everything is normal and suddenly there is a rise in the negative sentiments towards a particular subject. And uh, that could indicate something like a kind of an attack. And it also says that after an attack, the sentiment increases further. So the sentiment increases further. And this can be also one of the interesting distinguished uh, you know distinguished distinct behavioral pattern that we can analyze by analyzing the sentiment over a period of time and in this case a kind of an attack because in this case an author has tried to understand or correlate how sentiment and cyber attacks can be correlated so in this case he is able to establish cyber attacks with respect to sentiment and then you know is able to understand or classify different types of uh, cyber attacks in this case uh, whether the email sent is malicious or what was whether it is a malicious URL or whether it was malware. So these are the three types of attacks the user, sorry, the researcher was able to distinguish based on uh, the sentiment that was expressed. Then again, there is another study that's called as sexual predator system. Now, this is very important because today most of us, because according to one of the studies, uh, children in the age group or uh, students or it could be any, anybody in the age group of 11 to 16 years now they have what is known as the social media accounts now when they have a social media accounts now they are actually prone to a lot of uh, you know uh, a lot of uh, you can say bad people so that means uh, there are various people working to prevent uh, uh, you know to prevent uh, uh, the the the, uh, the people in the age group of uh, 11 to 16 from being uh, mismanaged by uh, those whom, whom we call as predators, right? So uh, uh, it's believed it's believed that you know the psychology is, says that the person who indulges in these kind of uh, activities they have uh, they are they are actually uh, they have some kind of an abnormal behavior. So this particular study uh, uh, depicts or this particular study say uh, you know tries to unravel or uncover the vocabulary part of the predator that means if somebody is trying to uh, you know take advantage of uh, the children online uh, and you know and misuse them okay because we have seen a lot of reports uh, we have gone through a lot of reports about these things if somebody is trying to do it 
so their vocabulary uh, their vocabulary and their lexicons uh, their analysis their emotion analysis and all these things can be used as uh, spb that is uh, social behavioral biometrics in order to understand and uh, you know contain uh, these kind of uh, predators from actually uh, you know affecting uh, the young people who are uh, you know using the social networking sites now again there have been research that has been done and people have so have shown a tremendous uh, results only by using basic uh, learning algorithms so again uh, the figure show also talks about the different emotions i because at the moment i mentioned something called the emotion analysis uh, again emotion analysis is also a different uh, subject altogether there are different emotions that are involved so based on these emotion analysis so uh, emotion analysis can be used to understand uh, the emotion of the the uh, the what is known as the 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 person who indulges in these things so that could also be one of the good example where svb can be uh, coming into picture to understand or prevent these things from happening then you have something called the uh, the biometric systems that can be used that's called as de identification for privacy in cyberspace so when we say when we talk about something called uh, 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 like you know the objective is whatever we are doing online we are actually leaving a social print okay we are leaving a basically a digital print we know for sure that so when we talk about digital print then there is a lot of question like uh, you know uh, privacy uh, uh, the social networking sites are obligated to provide the privacy and so on now in this context how de identification can be a very important part now there are many definitions that are given by uh, uh, the researchers one of the definition of de identification is that de identification is defined as a process of removing personal identifiers by modifying or replacing them to conceal some of the information from public view so that is what we call as de identification it could be something like uh, you are obscuring the traditional or auxiliary social biometrics traits or both of them to hide the identity of the users because there are cases there are situations where you know if somebody analyzes uh, the movement or the liter uh, the the style or somebody analyzes the traits from the social networking sites they get to know what is known as these uh, the behavioral pattern or they get to know the the author or they be able to get to know the uh, the uh, what's known as the person right so in order to prevent it from happening because there are many cases where anonymity is to be maintained where anonymity is to be preserved where privacy is to be uh, strictly followed in this context de identification becomes very important where de identification remove, removes you know some of the important traits so that it will not be you know it will not be uh, uh, it, it, it can preserve what is known as the privacy part of it i'm just you know uh, okay let's uh, uh, quickly go to what is known as the applications so there are many applications as such one is with respect to cybersecurity because uh, i've been talking about because today every government is involved in monitoring the social networking sites physically logically and so on so there are there is a potential there is a, uh, you know for example hate messages so hate messages is happening so every government is monitoring it so that's one very important advantage the other uh, the other application i spoke about is continuous authentication so that i spoke already the third one is basically you know we need to maintain anonymity because in some cases uh, when some incident happens the victims identity needs to be kept anonymous but unfortunately by masking the name we cannot make that person anonymous the style the social behavioral biometrics or the other traits of the biometrics needs to be also made anonymous so this is also becomes very important and again it's used in what is known as multi factor authentication video surveillance risk analysis uh, because risk analysis becomes very important because analyzing the social media i can we can know whether allowing certain people from one country to the other country whether it can be risky or not based on their profiles then you have something called mental illness advertisements entertainments and so on okay so yeah so i think i'll stop here because i think i've taken much of your time no sir it's okay
any questions from the audience uh, sir please repeat that uh, call stack once again na which call one stack. Call, stack. Call, call, call stack call stack call stack, stack. yeah uh, you mean the uh, beginning of your slides Maybe yeah, in that you have mentioned the program counter and uh, that is used to detect the intrusion, intrusion detection and the anomaly detection. Yeah, this one. Yes, 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 yes. Please yeah. share the slides, sir. Yeah, okay. I can share these slides. I can share these slides with you. Yes. Yeah, so no. please, ex please explain that partner, st uh, call stack mm -hmm. once again. Uh, this see basically the call stack is something like you know, uh, it depends on every program. We know something like program counter, right? Yeah. So the program counter basically keeps track of the uh, the programs that been executed. Yeah. So ideally, you know, you can visualize that every program when they are created, when they are executed, a virtual path is created. Yes, sir. So when the virtual path is created, so we need to establish whether this virtual path is that that is created, whether it is the normal virtual path that is getting uh, that is created, or whether it is an abnormal path. Okay. So the difference between a normal and abnormal comes to picture only when you ascertain what is normal and what could be abnormal okay sir and and sir one more question yes. uh, there you have mentioned the three attacks right the malicious email man, uh, malicious uh, url and the yes. third i think endpoint malware yes right? yes yes so what is this endpoint malware endpoint is your uh, uh, endpoint is basically your system your application your process Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Sir, I would like to ask you the opinion or uh, you just give the give your uh, view, sir. Yeah. I want to discuss something with you. Like, uh, See, as we know that uh, the social, I mean, uh, human behavior is different in physical world and the digital world uh, in the cyberspace. So uh, he's, he behaves very uh, uh, differently. For example, uh, I can give you uh, a person may be very introvert and very less talkative in the physical world. He may be good at writing and communication skill in digital world. Yes. So he can write very nicely with very, uh, he, he might having very much vocabulary and he, he may write very good, like an experienced person. So yes. both, both are, uh, you know, contradictory. So he may very not good. speak much, but uh, he will be uh, good at writing. Yes. And one person may be a criminal in the uh, cyberspace or in the digital world, but he may be very good in the physical world. He may behave like a very humble person. Yes. So like that, the behavior of a human being is very, very different in physical world and the digital world. Correct. So with respect to the biometrics, so biometrics, uh, we search for physical characteristics and also behavior of characteristics. So this physical characteristics uh, never come into picture with respect to digital world. So of course, uh, fingerprint, they may tell whenever, uh, you know, his fingerprint uh, Im impression if, if we get in case of digital crime investigation. But it is very rare, I think, because now we can, we see only uh, like, uh, uh, you know, money, I mean, bank fraud or uh, digital, in case of digital crimes, so physical characteristics will not um, help much. Correct. And uh, for behavior characteristics, only if it is available like CC camera, CCTV footage, or any voice recorded, uh, you know, any device we get, we get, we can analyze digital uh, evidences from those. Correct. So behavior, behavior characteristics may help in mapping a criminal in digital world with the crime. Correct. So only thing if uh, the uh, very rare case only signature may be available and uh, uh, try, you know, gate uh, his uh, walking style or uh, only when we get the video footages or yeah. what's recorded. So, so yeah. um, I hope this biometric uh, is more suitable for security systems and authentication systems, yeah. but less. It, it has less uh, you know, contribution to 
uh, you know, investigate digital crimes because in digital crimes, we search for digital evidences. So in case of collecting digital evidences, only social behavior, I mean, in cyberspace, a person who, how he behaves in digital world or the cyberspace, that only gives very much, you know, uh, helpful well, for digital crime investigation. So that means how he behaves in cyber uh, space, how he uses the internet, how he uh, you know use that uh, for his day to day life. So that is very important. So maybe that uh, in now uh, uh, presently that kind of uh, systems are not uh, matured and not uh, using because those kinds of things are available only in the uh, volatile memory that is uh, RAM or uh, uh, log files or registry or cache memory and all. So in that case, uh, any investigator has to think and the researcher has, has to think. And if social behavior in the cyberspace, if studied properly, maybe uh, a profile, a biodata can be prepared automatically by his behavior in the cyberspace. So by uh, by studying the you know connections with all the social uh, uh, you know media, how he behaves and how we use the online transaction and how we use uh, for knowledge sake, how we use for entertainment sake. So collectively, uh, a system or application which is to be built for his uh, you know by uh, based on his behavior. So that may be completely different from our what we write the biodata, how we write our uh, you know CV or biodata physically, how we perform and all. So that would be different from the uh, digital uh, biodata. So that can be an application can be built just to build a biodata or the behavior of a person by studying all these you know usages day to day usages of a person. So once uh, studied definitely his usage will be unique from others individual usage will be in, unique from others so this kind of uh, digital evidence will be helped in digital crime investigation not, not the physical uh, characteristics like fingerprint or palm print or iris or anything they, those will help only in security systems for authentication. Authentication, correct. Yeah, for digital crime investigation, definitely only social behavior in the cyberspace only has to be taken care taken. Correct. Correct. But still, nobody is not considering them because um, in that way, computer systems are not made the, that memory and uh, log files and every uh, every uh, you know usage activity of his are not stored but if it is made in that way definitely uh, digital crimes can be reduced i think so this is my view no uh, madam, like uh, what you said is very right like uh, 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 see basically uh, everybody I mean, not i mean most of the cases that uh, actually be uh, solved, like especially in the case of uh, uh, social networking or uh, web related uh, uh, cases, you know, uh, the anonymity that is when the person is very anonymous, like there were times when a uh, user had multiple personalities, like for example, he could be something physically and he could be offline, uh, online, he could be different. Yeah. But today, uh, you know, because of the technologies, like, uh, you know, analyzing these uh, traits, it is possible to establish, you know, these behaviors to that particular person. So yes. it is possible for us to identify that this person has multiple personalities. Yes. He is socially active or he is socially different and physically he is different. So that means it is possible for us to establish based on the technology that's available today as of today. Yes, definitely. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, with this uh, you know, statement, uh, I would like to uh thank you and thank and also i appreciate your efforts sir uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, taking in this work and uh, done very good uh, work and uh, thank no, you thanks a lot sir no in fact uh, it, it helped me also to you know open my uh, research avenues as well 
now i can think you know uh, using uh, biometrics social biometrics as one of the things biometrics and digital forensics are not directly related hmm. they won't help much but in case of uh, as i told you only cctv pages and uh, recorded voice only will yes. help uh, so those technology are now i know defeated by deep fakes so deep fakes uh, yeah they, they can create voice they can imitate the behavior of a person those cannot be even differentiate with the genuine one Correct. Uh, no technology can, uh, you know, exactly uh, accurately differentiate with those. So when these technologies are uh, creating uh, false uh, evidences, even that also will not help. But actual usage of a person day to day life that definitely helps. Yeah, basically, the what we are trying to do is we are trying to capture the social interactions that he is having, and then uh, build a social profile of it, and then identify. uh you know uh, whether uh these social profiles can be considered uh for uh, effective uh, identification of the subject and so on hage we are trying to do it yes yes sir okay okay sir thank you very much thank uh, you madam thank you for the opportunity uh, given i think